And hello, good morning and good evening, good afternoon to everyone. We are really pleased to have you with us. Thank you for joining us today at this session of Sea of Solutions, where we explore how cutting edge technology and innovation and the equitable and, cutting and affordable access to such technologies could contribute to cleaner, healthier oceans and a more resilient environment for people and for the planet. My name is Shireen Zorba. I head the UN Science Policy Business Forum, and I will be your moderator for this session. As we all know, unsustainable consumption and production over the last 50 years and the escalating use of natural resources has led to environmental degradation and the generation of vast amounts of waste, especially plastic waste. In this age of plastic, plastic waste estimated at over 33 billion tons is expected to accumulate around the planet by 2050, much of it ending up in our oceans. Global efforts to efficiently manage plastic waste fall short. A complex set of policies, regulatory frameworks, financing, technologies, and cooperation is required to tackle this gigantic issue at scale. Today's panel will examine what opportunities technology and innovation present to help tackle marine plastic debris, save precious ecosystems and biodiversity, and achieve a circular economy. Our panelists will also consider what enabling conditions are required to implement some of these solutions equitably and at scale. At the end of the session, we will be pleased to take your questions and share your views and your comments. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Anne Bowser is data expert with the UN Environment Programme, working on marine litter. She's also a citizen science pioneer and works with the Wilson Center as head of innovation. Haishal Davian is co-founder and chief technology officer at Cryo, a blockchain studio based in Amsterdam and Singapore that explores the cutting edge of blockchain technology and its applications for industry and sustainability. KNC is CEO of Hengiap Industries, a company that is at the forefront of plastic recycling, whose operations are run from a, globe, a gold standard GBI certified green building and who turns ocean plastic into sustainable materials for industry. Sankar Villapurn is Associate Director at Arup, a consultancy firm specialized in low carbon urban services and climate positive urban planning. And let me start the session by asking you this. The UN Environment Programme and member states will convene a very important fifth United Nations Environment Assembly in just a few weeks, where marine litter, especially plastic waste, is high on the agenda. Please take us through the efforts of the Global Partnership of Marine Litter, the United Nations and partners to tackle this problem using the latest in artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies. Over to you, Ed. Thank you for having me, Shireen. The title of this session touches on innovation, digital transformation, and frontier technologies. And as someone who has studied online communities since grad school, when I hear these phrases, I think about coordination, including coordination of digital resources and, dig and coordination of people. The Global Partnership on Marine Litter is a multi-stakeholder platform that aims to help end plastic pollution. It seems only fitting that UNEP has a policy mandate to create a digital platform to support and complement GPML with the first phase to be released at UNEA 5. The digital multi-stakeholder platform will integrate curated, high-quality data and information from multiple sources, connect stakeholders, identify gaps and priority actions, coordinate and guide action, and facilitate target setting and measuring progress against the SDGs, as well as other environmental indicators. Really, this comes down to coordinating digital resources and supporting people through virtual interactions. We have a number of innovative ways to do this, including by providing access to a platform that allows people to do things like map and visualize data, access a range of resources, and also take advantage of social features such as matchmaking. 
For example, when we decided to take stock of submissions from various actions to reduce the flow of marine litter and microplastics to the oceans, rather than giving a series of lectures or publishing a white paper, we created something more interactive. The first product is the online repository. It contains all survey submissions and narrative submissions. The users can view each individual submissions and gain access to additional information. The repository contains customized filters, which allows to search for submissions on a number of topics. This is the online repository. As previously mentioned, it contains all the service submissions and narrative submissions. You can use the search bar on top to find narrative submissions by looking for the word narrative. You can use the map on the right to filter on specific countries. You can select multiple countries at once. You can deselect by clicking again. On top, you can also click on the little X to remove any country selection. I'm interested in projects that are taking place in Croatia. When I go to filter projects, there are a number of filters I can apply to search for submissions. You can select multiple filters at once. I am looking for projects in Croatia that are relating to reducing plastics. When you click on a specific action, you can find more information about that action. So this demo looks pretty simple, but it shows over 100 submissions and offering tools like this allows people to access content that they want on demand, whatever they want, whenever they need it and in real time. And this basically meets the expectations of how we access most information in today's digital society. When I think of innovative digital solutions, I also realize that technology itself isn't the solution. It needs to be coupled with policy. In the case of the GPML digital platform, also science, and it needs to make science and policy and other resources more accessible. Earlier this year, UNEP worked with IBM to develop resources for a pilot version of the GPML digital platform that tried to do just this by creating an accessible interface through a virtual artificial intelligence agent called SAM. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sam. I am the United Nations Environment Program Digital Assistant for Marine Litter. How can I help you? What is your purpose? My purpose is to make access to the information contained in the United Nations Environment Program's global platform on marine litter simple and accessible to all. Whether you are a concerned citizen, a member state or an industry representative, a local government official, or a member of a non-profit, or anyone who lives on this great blue planet called Earth. The goal is to help drive action on the issue of marine litter. Tell me about your technology. I use IBM Watson speech to text to transcribe your voice, IBM Watson Assistant to understand and answer your questions, and Soul Machine's digital twin and human OS technology to bring me to life. I am built to provide the initial interface into the UNEP global data platform for marine litter. This platform will also use advanced data and AI technology in IBM Cloud Pack for data to provide for data governance, cataloging, search, analysis, and allow AI and machine learning to be used to gain additional insights on the issue of marine litter. In the terms we use in IBM Data and AI, this solution climbs the artificial intelligence AI ladder. So Sam is a young AI and he's a little awkward and still has a lot to learn. But pilot testing, including with various governments, has showed us that SAM can be helpful for creating an emotional link to the platform and to the issue of marine litter and plastic pollution. And we think this is really important to help create the solutions that we need. So we're developing resources like SAM, the stock taking assessment, and many others to be debuted in just a few weeks. So thank you for the opportunity to share. 
Thank you very much. And that was interesting. And uh, Sam indeed has a lot to learn, but clearly he's a fast learner and seems quite keen. So having seen that, now I want to ask you what is the level of ambition in terms of deploying such technologies? And in your point of view, what are the main uh, challenges and what are the opportunities moving forward? The level of ambition is extremely high. UNEP works with a wide range of partners and the GPML digital platform is no exception. So what we're trying to do and I think will achieve is offer a one-stop shop for very curated, high quality data and other sources of information like videos, like avatars related to plastic pollution and marine litter that other people and other platforms can then access. In terms of barriers, I think a lot of the technology is already there. The challenges are things like ensuring data quality, so coming up with a robust system for review, and as Sam demonstrates, making it accessible to a wide range of audiences, including scientific and technical audiences, governments, and public citizens. I will have to um, use this opportunity to ask you a little bit about data and the role of citizen science. You are playing a very important role in this area together with your colleagues uh, from all over the world trying to uh, further the advances uh, in uh, citizen science uh, approaches and also the uptake of citizen science. So just tell me a little bit about that in this context. Thanks for asking, Shireen. You know, citizen science is a movement that has been around for hundreds of years, but it's really starting to gain maturity in part thanks to digital platforms like this one and technologies. And plastic pollution is one of the issues that is becoming most important from a citizen science perspective. We already have a number of groups around the world that are doing beach cleanups. And in the process, they're collecting structured data on exactly what it is that they're seeing and, and cleaning up from the environment. And this is also an opportunity to look at contributions towards monitoring progress towards SDGs like 1411B, which looks at the health of the oceans is monitored by things like marine litter on beaches. So citizen science is a huge opportunity to collect a lot of data very quickly and efficiently in order to support better monitoring of the SDGs but then probably more excitingly, bringing people into the process is also an opportunity for outreach and education and linking data to concrete action. And when we talk about delivering the SDGs, in addition to just monitoring, those are exactly the types of things that need to happen. Thank you very much, Anne Bowser. Now, Heichel, let us speak about blockchain and why and how can blockchain help us tackle plastic waste? Yes, hi Shri. Thanks for the question. So blockchain, essentially what it allows us to do is to tackle this problem in a systematic way. Um, we have a lot of great innovations happening on the way we manage waste, for example, process waste and recycle. Um, but it still feels like a lot of organizations are tackling this problem against the world. Um, so blockchain is, allows us to create systems in a way um, that introduces accountability um, allows for a streamlining of collaboration and even uh, introducing incentives for organizations to start collaborating and, and challenging um, or tackling these problems in a, in a, as a group together with one another. Um, so to basically minimize that uphill battle that um, a lot of organizations are facing in competing with one, uh, one another, we can start collaborating with one another. Can you give me an example? Um, so, yeah, so an example or maybe to zoom out a bit um, more is because the one of the challenges we have right now is the system that we're all optimizing towards is just the monetary system. So everyone's optimizing and, and trying to compete, for example, on price, quality, um, and they're not looking at other metrics that are very much important, um, such as environmental impact or in, more specifically in, in, in plastic. So once we can start creating systems that can compete um, with these destructive systems that we have in place and introduce new metrics, um, essentially of competition, uh, we can start streamlining this collaboration and have more people collaborate using these metrics, taking them into account um, instead of just neglecting it and, and basically keeping us where we are at right now. 
Now, I want to ask you, what barriers and opportunities do you see for the application of blockchain technology in this field, including, of course, uh, you know, our outlook for the developing world and the least developed countries? Um, yeah, so some challenges that we have with blockchain is so blockchain is you create a system um, that streamlines this collaboration, but you have to get it right. So it, at first, it's it's a decentralized system. Um, so there's no, let's say, authority that sits in the middle that is there to um, pick up small problems. Like, for example, for those familiar with the entire crypto boom from 2017, uh, some people lost their private keys. So this is essentially like the password that you have to your crypto account. Um, and if you lose your password, you don't have access to that account anymore. Um, so these small problems, for example, for the end consumer uh, still have to be addressed um, because there's, it's not as easy as having a, a party in the middle that you can just call up and, and ask them to solve it. You have to have uh, solve it in a systematic way as well. Um, so that is one thing, um, making the technology easy to use to the end consumer. Um, another thing that I see as a challenge is coupling these systems with the, the physical world. So how do I know that activities or actions happening in the real world are correctly represented in this digital world? Um, this is also requires a lot of clever, um, let's say, engineering in a way that you can have um, information that's being broadcasted to the to the ledger um, be validated by other parties. So it's not just about interacting with a ledger, but it's more about how do you um, make sure that the data is trustworthy and in whose hands um, or who gets to report on what in this ledger to, to make it believable. To what extent do you believe that lack of awareness about the technology itself and what goes into it may be a barrier and to what extent do you feel that uh, we are lifting that kind of veil uh, you know uh, of understanding of the technology everybody's using the terminology blockchain but to what extent do you feel that say investors policymakers, people working in these areas uh, on the ground including at the local level are actually aware of the opportunities and the benefits of investment in these areas yeah i think their awareness is increasing uh, more and more i think more and more um, individuals and organizations are becoming aware that it's, it's this technology that's here to stay and i mean once the pandora's box been opened it's difficult to go back um, i think the challenges with the awareness is to be able to let go of the let's say the old way of thinking the competitive way of thinking in that sense um, because now you're not trying to create a new tech startup with this technology you're essentially aiming to create digital public infrastructures um, that people and organizations will be able to use um, that, that is beneficial to them. So an analogy I'd like to use is like going back in 2007, for example, when we, uh, I started using Facebook, my perception of Facebook was it is this tool that is freely available and I can get benefits off of it by interacting with my loved ones and exchanging information um, with them. And, and now that we are learning more and more that it's this centralized solution, it's essentially a black box and it's not the public utility we once thought it was, um, that we're seeing the consequences of that. Um, and that, that is what blockchain is um, enabling is to really create these public digital infrastructures that we can all benefit from without having that, that party in the middle. Um, and this is challenging, especially in like in, in our industry, is convincing these organizations that you are not creating the next Facebook that you can benefit and, and make a lot of money from. No, you're creating a tool for the public. You're initiating a movement, um, and and not you don't own the movement. So, in that sense, it's challenging because we have to convince the the early adopters that you are creating something not for yourself. Um, and that you will benefit from in, in the future because other parties will join uh, the network rather than me being in the middle of the network. Understood. Thank you so much, uh, Heichel. Now, I want to uh, move to another topic with uh, Kian. 
uh, and Kean Hengkiap Industries is a recycling pioneer uh, in the region. Uh, we find that waste management systems in many countries across uh, Southeast Asia and the world are overwhelmed and maybe inadequate. Uh, I want you to share with us uh, how can we make recycling technologies more accessible and within reach to tackle plastic pollution at scale, uh, especially at the national and local levels from your own experience. Thank you, Serene, and thank you, everyone. Um, I, I think from my experience, I think that would be a good start. Um, I started my journey uh, being born in a recyclist family. So at the age of 10, uh, you know, that's when my parents uh, started uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, plastic recycling business. Uh, well, actually, the, uh, the entire recycling business being the, uh, the scavengers, collecting recyclables from household to household. So I think that's a really interesting childhood. And I always remember my parents uh, always tell us two things growing up. Uh, they want two things from us. The first thing is to get a degree, any degree. And the second thing is never become a recycler. And I think it's also associated with shame and it's not a, a glamorous uh, 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 industry, so on and so forth. So um, anyway, all four siblings did get our degree and then all four are recyclers right now. So that's the quick story, you know, to kind of ease it into our, our uh, experience here. So we basically work our way up from a scavengers and then a mobile pickers, yard owner processor. So we work our way up uh, in that informal community. Now, this is a, a, uh, a, um, a community that's very, very important in Southeast Asia or in developing country. Uh, it is because of the lack of uh, data as what we have to talk about today because of lack of uh, research and uh, understanding. Uh, the community is basically uh, underappreciated, you know, underfunded, and in many cases, very, very invisible. So, and that also caused the fragmentation yeah, across the entire industry of recycling and somehow through the market uh, dynamic, you know, we organize ourselves and, and also, because of the fragmentation, that's a lack of standard. So what we have done differently is that we curated an internal standard that has now become a de facto industrial standard that we are working with 28,000 independent uh, grassroots recyclers here in Malaysia. So what we have done is that um, from this a, a de facto industrial standard, we are converting that into a uh, algorithm through digitalization. And also segment by segment, we are working with local authorities uh, to basically craft the relevant policies to formalize the informal communities uh, from scavengers to mobile pickers, yard owner, and finally the aggregator sitting on top. Uh, the second things that we do that's very, very important is integrating uh, 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 basically horizontally from collection um, to conversion and then basically customizing all this raw material that is highly uh, niche and also it's a high performance material whereby today we are collecting 60,000 tons of plastic scrap. 70% um, of the product are exported to 33 different countries. Um, and also because we are integrated and also from our de facto industrial standard, that playbook enable us to convert from mixed plastic into a consistent uh, feedstock with a high integrity. And from there, we are able to customize uh, the material consistently. So that integration is very, very important. Um, and because of that horizontal uh, integration, today we are able to uh, mobilize part of our community, uh, our grassroots recycling community to work with NGOs, uh, uh, and also local community to collect ocean plastic, convert it to industrial product that fulfills all the top industrial standards, uh, co-create that with a product designer, and then finally we champion it with big brands uh, to, to basically offer this ocean plastic product to the conscientious consumer. And the entire uh, um, uh, the entire food chain, the entire uh, provenance or chain of custody uh, will basically be pieced under the QR code so that the consumer will know exactly where the plastic is going to come from, 
um, and for uh, example, they make into ocean plastic chairs. And if let's say the chair is broken, we'll collect that back and we will be able to recycle that back and give it a second life. So it is actually moving from a product centric to a life cycle centric uh, type of model. So I think, you know, in many developing countries, the informal community is the, uh, um, basically I call it the, the invisible hands of waste management and with the right financial tools, with the right policy, and also the right recycling technology, that's actually a lot that we can do uh, from this infrastructure. Back to you, Serene. Thank you so much. You know, just as a follow-up question, uh, clearly you're working with local communities, uh, you're, lo you're working at the grassroots level. Give me some figures in terms of the economic benefit in terms of job creation and how you saw that uh, develop uh, in the years from the time that you started until now. Um, the actual GP, uh, GDP, that's a, good, that's a good question, Serene. I don't have a number for that. However, we are working with 28,000 independent entities. So the entities registered with us and let's say, uh, if, let's say if average of them uh, employ three workers with them, yeah, three or four workers with them, you are looking at the possibility of creating more than 100,000 of jobs. Um, so from our playbook, uh, we basically will be able to create uh, the value creation uh, commercially. The most important thing is that we need to create value out of plastic. Uh, if you give us any plastic scrap, we'll look at it from a mechanical point of view. Point of view what is the inherent property from a mechanical point of view? From a thermal point of view, we make our own coal from plastic and we make it safe to burn. We are able to extract um, um, this uh, substance which will cause dioxin. So in our playbook, we are able to create and convert plastic into a clean uh, coal that you can actually burn. And then the third thing is that we look at it from a hydrocarbon point of view. So the value creation commercially is something that's very, very important. And then we continue to, to, to uh, uh, create a value from there. And as what uh, my colleague, uh, the earlier speaker, Haisha has mentioned, uh, with sustainability, you basically have more chance from the data to measure the impact and to be able to uh, monetize from the impact. And the other two will be the social compliance and environmental compliance. So my feeling is that Malaysia is actually the first uh, country whereby the industrial player has come together and basically submitted a white paper uh, to the government that we foresee there will be an advanced plastic recycling industry within 10 years. Um, so I think that's uh, the uh, context uh, for Malaysia, a case study for Malaysia, if you will. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kian. And I do hope we manage uh, maybe through the chat to get a link to your white paper. It would be of value. Uh, now moving to Shankar. Uh, Shankar, your company focuses on nature positive design planning and architecture for the built environment in 143 countries. Now, I want to know from you, how can we use innovative design and technology to build better? Um, okay, that's, that's a good question, Shirin. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, so the question is, do we need to build more? Uh, that's the first question uh, I, I, we always ask. Our population has grown from uh, 8 billion to 11 billion in the next probably within our lifetime at least. So that means we need lots and lots of infrastructure, which means we are not going to consume more and more. So the good question for us is, do we really need to build more? Could we reuse effectively what we have today? Uh, that's what we mean by a sustainable world. Um, and so that's the first question that we would like to ask. Um, the second point is innovation. Uh, innovation itself, it's, it's not really a rocket science sometimes. Uh, in fact, there are uh, very good topics on frugal innovation, which means that necessity is the mother of invention. When you have no choice, you could actually innovate with the minimum, minimum stuff. And then you can actually get the job done uh, without any bells and you know, other stuffs, right? So we adopt that there are three things in any kind of a world, physical world, which is the real world, uh, which we need to understand because how people work, how, how people behave is really important for us to understand. And then connecting them to actually the digital world, 
uh, which means the user experience. The digital, if it's going to be super complex, it's not going to work in at least half of the world. Uh, we have almost 4 billion population just in Asia and, and 2 billion in India and China itself. So the technology has to be super user friendly, super simple, uh, because most of the innovation today is based on platform, based on ecosystem. It, it's not like one top company or two top companies can, can change the world. We need a pure ecosystem place. So in that sense, uh, it's about, we need to understand no matter how much we have the resources without the help of the world, we can't change the world. So this physical world and a digital user experience uh, put in place together will actually help us to collect right kind of data, monitor and ensure that we actually have a feedback system to the loop. Uh, because innovation is not like a one-time effort. You can just deploy it and then you can just walk away. It's going to be a continuous process. So you need to have a feedback system. And that is exactly where, uh, whether technologies like blockchain, whether you want a machine learning model, uh, the fundamental is, do you have a closed loop to the, the end consumer, consumer and to all the way to the data process and to the policy maker? Because the policy makers need these data right from the ground uh, and so that they can ensure that these policies are workable and what they need to change. Uh, so this, this is what we believe in, in, in terms of whether it is building a sustainable world. It's about ensuring there is a closed loop, ensuring there is a connection between the policymakers, and also ensuring that there's awareness being built at the, at the front line, the people who are consumers, so that we can change the world slowly, little by little. Thank you so much, Shankar. Now, I want to move to the question of policy. And uh, having worked or you continue to work in so many countries around the world, what kind of policies are already in place that you feel are empowering and that we can learn from? And what type of policies do we need to uh, look forward to? Uh, especially that the United Nations Environment Assembly is going to convene, uh, it's just around the corner in February, and maybe a message to policymakers. Um, so policies are definitely varying uh, from you know, one country to another country. I primarily focus on Southeast Asia and each country has their own priorities. Uh, but depending upon the countries, if you just take like Vietnam, Philippines and Southeast Asia, the market, uh, I think economy is one of the important factor. Um, so as much as we want to bring in a policy, which is like rule based, uh, but these countries, at least I've seen like Vietnam and Thailand, Philippines, they're going to database policies rather than a rule based policies. Uh, it what used to be a populist policy is like, okay, I want to uplift my citizens. Now they don't to say like, what do we mean by uplift? Where are they and how could you change it? And so most of these governments are definitely becoming more uh, digital governance. Uh, that is a change that's happening. Uh, Indonesia, for example, is doing extraordinarily good job uh, in terms of, even though they call it a smart city, but basically they're focusing on their rural area uh, on how they could enhance their farmers how could they enhance their small, small and medium enterprises? And, and when they change the grassroots by giving them value-based, value-driven advantage, the policies become successful. So that's where the rule-based policies are becoming data-driven policies and making sure there's a close loop there. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Janka. I would like to now turn our attention to our audience and open the floor for questions and comments. So uh, the comments have been coming in. Uh, some of our panelists have already uh, been answering some of the questions. I'll bring those now uh, to uh, you know our global audience, but do feel free to share more. Uh, just as we do that, I've just received a message from our technical moderator inviting our uh, community Community to look at some of the lightning talks on the Hobilo event platform on exciting technology solutions, such as the re-glove, the recyclable PPE glove, uh, and more. So do go to Hobilo uh, on this platform and do have a look at the lightning uh, talks. Now, I'll move to um, the questions uh, that we have been receiving uh, from uh, multiple uh, participants. And the, the first one uh, is to Kian, where uh, the person is saying, I'm amazed uh, with your business. Uh, I was just wondering if you are also into renewable 
renewable energy in your recycling business. So Kian, uh, please go ahead. Sure. Um, yes, we are. Um, so what we do is that um, out of the 60,000 tons of plastic scrap that we receive, 3% uh, of that, we basically generate uh, renewable in it, uh, energy from that. So 97% uh, we upcycle the plastic material, uh, mainly for different application, but we do keep 3% um, so that we can actually generate renewable uh, uh, electricity to power um, one megawatt uh, of renewable electricity for our operation. So um, the reason that our company has that uh, green building uh, index um, status is because this is basically a smart factory whereby uh, we can operate in an off-grid environment um, that we harvest our own rainwater and then we drain, generate our own uh, 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 renewable electricity. Now, this is, this is very important, especially when we talk about ocean uh, plastic or river-based uh, uh, plastic scrap recovery. Uh, because of the condition of the ocean plastic and river plastic, uh, sometimes uh, a lot of that could not be upcycled and therefore chemical recycling is actually the best process to go to uh, that we can actually, we have an option of generating a, a clean diesel that fulfills the industrial standard EM590 or we can generate electricity from there. And I also picked up a question about working with building management uh, companies. That's something that we are doing. So on one end, we are working uh, with uh, digitalizing the uh, building management, uh, uh, with building management company to collect the plastic, um, to convert it, to recycle it, to make sure that we promote that plastic circularity. The other thing that we are working with building management company is providing a, uh, a, a net zero or plastic neutrality status. So here in Malaysia, the plastic consumption per capita is 16.8 kilogram per person. So depending how many residents are in there, if we can basically collect more than 16.8 uh, kilogram per person per year, uh, we can basically certify them building uh, to be plastic neutral. So the entire community living there would have this plastic neutrality status. So those are some of the things that we're doing. Over to you, Serene. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ken. Clearly from the questions, we're receiving a lot of interest in uh, that area. And now I would like to uh, maybe uh, go to Anne Bowser. And Anne, you received a question, a very important question actually, about promoting standard protocols for reporting of uh, little cleanups in citizen science programs, perhaps if, not only in citizen science programs and not only UNEP, but about standard protocols uh, for reporting reporting citizen science. I think this is uh, quite a, an important question and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks, Shireen. So standards is a really interesting word because you have a lot of topics that can be included under this umbrella. So data standards are about how information is structured and documented and then in addition, to data standards, which are basically a technical specification. You have standards for uh, collecting information. For example, some of the comments in the chat were through citizen science and beach cleanups, and then ideally aligning that information with public policy. So there are a lot of pieces to this puzzle. There are a lot of groups that are already working on various aspects of standards and interoperability. And one thing that the GPML digital platform is seeking to do is bring these people, especially from the research community together through a structured collaborations a framework called Action Tracks that we'll be releasing early next year. But then it's also important to make these standards accessible to people like citizen science volunteers. We had a comment from a 10 year old who is working on running beach cleanups in Thailand and wants to understand how to use citizen science. So as we're producing these very technical documents and you know lines of code in JSON, we also need to make sure that we're producing things that she can use to support whatever wonderful work is happening on the ground. Um, thank you very much. And um, maybe just a very, very, very quick one 
on financing and support to citizen science. Um, maybe more than that, what kind of policies do we require to support citizen science, uh, support us, and uh, what kind of financing is required? Where are we? So a lot of citizen science is invisible right now. It's coming in through established scientific methods or being reported by countries right now. But in order for the movement to be recognized as having the strength that it is, a lot more finance is needed. And I think specifically working with existing groups that are on the ground, including those that are aggregating data and issuing best practices and finding ways to support them is really important. And it's important to have a lot of sources for finance linked to various national schemes and national reporting strategies. I think about supply and demand a lot. There's a lot of supply for citizen science data and there's a lot of demand, but the question is linking them and funding is one form of a partnership agreement and a really concrete opportunity to make that link. Thank you very much, Han. Uh, I've received just a, a really interesting question uh, from uh, Alicia, who is a grade 10 in Green Green, in, uh, Green Green International School. And I think it's just a general question for our panel. Uh, let me read it, uh, and I hope it's clear enough. Um, she's saying, I was wondering uh, if even though a lot of these solutions are technology based, how these could physical, legal and electronic platforms be implemented in countries that are more conservative in their mindset, politics, as well as having a poor economy. I think this is a very uh, pertinent question, and who would like to take this one up? Perhaps I'll start uh, with the blockchain uh, discussion in that area, one of the uh, more kind of frontier technologies, innovative technologies. Uh, Hacha, what do you think? Yeah, so it, it is a difficult challenge because um, eventually the information has to be put in the digital world. Um, and you, you want to implement it in a way that it doesn't have this um, high threshold of behavior change for the for the end consumer, um, and the, there are different ways of tackling this. For example, um, keeping it as simple as having a card with a QR code that um, holds information that can be scanned uh, by by some digital uh, infrastructure. But that link is is still a difficult challenge. Like we've tackled a problem uh, once uh, with an NGO. I can't name names but it was regarding uh, traceability from farms in, in the rice fields um, all the way to the end consumers. And we did face a lot of challenges in making this technology um, easy for the farmers to use because some of them don't have a mobile phone to scan. And, and how do you also in, in incorporate them in the solution um, has been a challenge that, that we've seen. Um, but bringing it down to like a, a scannable QR code, for example, that triggers a transactions once they um, have a, a scanner that they're able to access um, might be a solution. Thank but you it, so much. Sharin, Go can ahead. I just supplement? Uh, exactly, so I was just, it's I a, was it's just a, coming to you. <laughs> yeah, it's a brilliant <laughs> question, Alicia. Uh, very well done. Um, so before we, we think about technology, we need to always think about the benefit for the users, uh, end users. Uh, yeah. What is in it for everybody? Um, we, we need to accept that what we think is good for the world, actually we are talking about it's food for many families. So we cannot ask people to do charity when, when it is actually their core business, core meal, right? So technology, people always do when there is a benefit for them. Uh, why Gojek is so popular in Indonesia? It's not done by the government because people see that there is no public transport and now there is something better for their lives. They will adapt it very much. So when we try to bring in technology and solution, we should always think about what is in it for the consumers? What is it actually, why would they pay for it? What is the bigger benefit for them to do so? Uh, even in a very developed world, educated world, uh, our water services uh, department in Hong Kong always says that, you know, you consume more water as compared to another home uh, near a similar size as you. That doesn't change my behavior because it's so cheap and then I can just use it. I waste water. Uh, this, is, this is a guilt, right? So it's always about what is a bigger benefit for you uh, when you want to take an action, you want to change your behavior, there should be a benefit for there. Uh, and then people will automatically adapt. 
Uh, actually, I want to uh, thank Alicia for her engagement and yes. for uh, an excellent question that has uh, so many different uh, facets to it. Um, well, we are reaching uh, quite fast uh, the end of this very important and really exciting session. Uh, but before we do so, perhaps each one of our pal panelists would take like two minutes to share with us in um, free form your ideas, your thoughts uh, in conclusion. And what messages would you uh, want to um, uh, uh, give to the world, uh, to policy makers, to investment uh, figures when it comes to the issue of technology uh, and sustainability in general, but specifically when we also talk about uh, plastic waste uh, and the marine environment. So I'll start with Shankar. Shankar, I think you're muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start with a very short story that most of you would know, which is called Rabbit and Tortoise Story. Uh, and the tortoise is the government, which is always shell protected. It's protective. It doesn't want to change because people think that they don't need to change. And so the tortoise always used to win because the rabbit used to sleep. And the rabbit here is the technology to. Uh, and so, but rabbit caught up and next race, the second race, rabbit won. It didn't sleep. The third race, tortoise has become clever. I will actually add another kind of bureaucratic process so that the rabbit will lose. So he changed the race course by adding a river on the pathway so the tortoise, uh, the rabbit ran fast, but it couldn't cross the river. And the tortoise still swim by bureaucratic mechanism. But today's world, we are having an equal race course. Technology is democratizing the world. So the rabbit and tortoise need to understand that the rabbit need to carry the tortoise on the land and tortoise need to carry the rabbit in the water. So this is the small story I would tell you that we need to work together. Um, do you have any specific hints as to the how, especially with your vast experience? I'm sure you've seen some wonderful examples and maybe not so wonderful examples. So give me like maybe two or three points that you feel are specific and that uh, have been more or less a lesson learned uh, in your area of... Right, uh, two, two parts. One. Technology is not expensive. Uh, this is just only a myth. Uh, and it is only a myth when, when, when you go to the vendor, buy a technology product proprietary, then it is always seems to be expensive. Uh, there are lots of open source technologies available. If we just try to look for the open source technologies, this will become a sustainable for most of the emerging markets. So don't just go by the fact when, when a vendor says that, oh, this will cost you so much money because we have spent a lot of R&D on it. Uh, don't just take the word, go and look out. There are lots of wonderful technologies available, which is open source. The second part is on the sustainability uh, data. Data has huge value and huge money in the market. Why would hackers hack your data, millions of data, because they're selling your data. So think about business models where you can actually make it open data and also the data could be sold so that that could actually give in kind of revenue stream to invest further on these technologies. So. Think about open new business models about what is in it for us? Why would anybody do you know, at a subsidized rate? Because they want your data and they are trying to make use of your data to sell the data. Why can't you do it? So think about from a UN perspective, I will give all these data anonymized, but then I want to get subsidy from your technologies. Give me subsidies. Uh, so this is win-win for both ways. It is only needing a new commercial model and people who understand really what is the value of data in the market. Thank you very much, Shankar. Uh, Kian, the floor. Sure. I, I think nowadays, um, uh, plastic consumer, uh, which is all of us, are asking very different sets of questions compared to before. Uh, in the past, we want things to be smarter, faster, prettier, cheaper. That's the question that we asked. Uh, but now that as we become more and more sophisticated, better educated about plastic pollution and marine pollution issue, we start to ask very different sets of questions. We will ask that whenever we use a plastic, can we avoid it? Can we reduce that? And if we really have to use that plastic, that it comes down to this question, where does it come from and where is this going to go? after consumption. So because of the technology right now, we now can actually have that perfect circularity of hydrocarbon. 
Um, it can be plastic, it can be biogases, it can be diesel, it can be electricity, all that perfect circularity of hydrocarbon is possible. So conscientious consumer are uh, now when they when, when we need to use plastic, we want to have that sustainability content in there. In there. We want to have that upcycle content in there. And I think that's something that's very important. And once I'm done with this, uh, where am I going to dispose this, you know, regardless where I am, in a developed country or in a developing country or in underdeveloped countries? So what are some of the possibility for us to do this? And I think today our panel cover a lot of that. Um, so government are putting different efforts and businesses are coming together. And then what is truly exciting is the possibility of uh, a digital platform and digitalization that we bring onto here. So my, 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 my personal uh, 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 feeling is this, my personal observation is this, There's a, there is a quiet evolution that's going on. So basically we are combining sustainability and also digitalization together. When we put these two together, magic happens. And that is how we can sustain our 8 billion and 11 billion population uh, in the future. Back to you, this, Shireen. This is good to hear. Thank you very much. Uh, Heisel, over to you. Yeah, so I guess we're, we're at a very interesting point in time right now. Uh, there's a lot of technological innovations happening in how we handle waste, how we deal with production, um, and how we want to hold uh, organizations, for example, accountable for the waste that is produced. Um, and now we're, we're in a pivotal moment where we see this, for this uh, open source movement, for example, how it's taken over the software world um, and basically winning the proprietary uh, model. We see this also uh, happening um, throughout the, the sustainability field. And I think, for example, blockchain is playing a fundamental role um, in allowing these bottom-up movements to, uh, to take over the world. Like, for example, we've seen in 2017, the, the, uh, a lot of people were thinking about where I'm purchasing cryptos, but what they actually were doing were they, they were investing in projects. Um, and I think this is where we're at, where ideas are now being a, are um, able to be funded by the bottom up movement. If, if people see a value in, in the technology and the solutions, they're able to contribute to that. Um, and I think it will eventually bubble all the way up um, from the bottom up to, to actually change the world. Um, so I guess what I'd like to leave everyone with is we are in this pivotal moment. There's a lot of opportunities um, and it will require all of us to come together um, in order to achieve this. Solving these environmental issues is not going to be in one organization's hand, but it would require the collaboration efforts of organizations, individuals, and policymakers um, to achieve that. Thank you, Heichel. Thank you very much. And now the last words are with you. Go ahead. Well, I had the benefit of learning from everybody else on this panel, as well as hearing their key takeaways. And I think mine actually build on a lot of the points that have already been made. So the two key themes that I pulled out were transparency and openness on one hand and collaboration and action on the other. I shall just mention open source as a global trend. So when we approach this through the GPML digital platform, we think about the provision of open access resources and especially open data, but for broader efforts around transparency, solutions such as blockchain are equally important. On the collaboration and action front, to combat plastic pollution, we need to augment data and technology with both of these aspects. And this is important on the high level from the top down because there's no single technology or platform that has all of the solutions, but we need a federation of government, uh, private sector and NGO actors that all have different pieces of the puzzle to contribute. And we also need to leverage data and technology to drive action on the ground, whether by creating value out of plastics or by engaging citizens through beach cleanup campaigns. Thank you very much, Anne, indeed.
Now, this brings us really to the end of our panel, and I'm pretty pleased we did keep to time, so I hope our organizers will be happy. I want to thank Anne Bowser, Heichel Debian, KNC, and Shankar uh, Viluparan for being with us today. And indeed, I do hope that this session helps us all understand better the great opportunities innovation and technology provide to tackle plastic pollution and shed light on the tools and systems we need to build, we need to build back better in order to efficiently, effectively and equitably uh, deploy these technologies for good. Please stay with us for the rest of the sessions uh, in uh, this uh, exciting uh, conference and uh, we wish you all the very best. Goodbye. Thanks, Shireen, so much for your expert moderation. Um, and thank you all for attending CEO Solutions and particularly for attending this session. Um, I just wanted to let you know uh, about the sessions that are coming up, uh, which includes Parallel Session 7, um, Enhancing Recyclability Through Better Product Labeling in Southeast Asia, as well as Parallel Session 8, Leaving No One Behind, Protecting Informal Waste Workers and Those Most Vulnerable um, in Times of COVID. I'm going to paste a link now into the chat that you can click in order to join, um, uh, to find the joining instructions for uh, these sessions. You can click program and click the specific section session that you're planning on joining. You're also welcome to explore the exhibitions and chat or set up meetings with other conference attendees. And we're also excited to invite you to contribute to showcasing your voices for solutions to plastic solution. Um, we're seeking a simple but powerful pledge, a commitment or statement to less plastic wasted from the perspective of your work. You're, you can submit your pledge by going to the Hubelo community via the link in the chat and clicking pledges. Thank you once again for your participation. Thank you very much for being here from all of the locations that you're joining us from around the world and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much, Irene, and thank you, Natalie. It's been great joining you. Good luck with the rest of the conference. I am going to end the meeting now.